In a Utah prison, a family tradition is getting out of hand. When you grow up in it or, or you have family members, you just automatically just go where your family is. That's kind of like religion. There, there's so many in it, I don't even know half of them. The younger generation. They spill blood, flaunt weapons, and order hits, even behind bars. A bunch of alpha males running around trying to determine who's the king of the jungle. Officers have to stop the violence before it spreads. I like beating people and watching blood squirt out. Inside Utah State Prison, this extended family is all about a gang. This full-service facility sits at the base of the Rockies. Inside live 80% of the states incarcerated. The massive complex houses all security levels, from thieves to serial murderers, and contains its own mental health facility. USP is also home to the state's most dangerous women, over 400 of them. Their records as varied as the men's. But the biggest challenge in this prison, controlling gangs. The problem with having gangs uh, inside an institution is they start to click up. They start to develop their own little societies inside the prison. They start to get involved in uh, the smuggling trade, like trying to smuggle tobacco into the, or drugs into the institution. They run a little, almost like a mafia type organization. Okay, I need you all to move down here. I would say the largest percentage of the inmates that come through the gates of the prison. If they're not in a gang when they get here, they're probably gonna join one before they get out. For the most part, it's 23-hour lockup. Your recreation will be inside the sections, okay? Anytime you come out of the sections, you will be in restraints. One of the most important forms that we need you to fill out is the body disposition completely with a name and an address and a phone number of somebody we can contact in the event that you die while you're inside the institution. My suggestion, guys, is if you're gang affiliated in check, and you better put it in check in a hurry, because your time is due. Okay? Stay out of the gang crap. P has a long list of gangs: the Sorenos, Crips, Aryan groups. Most began as street gangs. Behind bars, rigid codes keep members in line, disobey gang leaders' orders, and face bodily harm. All right. All right. Gangs like the California-based Serenos are notorious for violence. Behind bars, they created a criminal empire by forcing smaller Latino gangs to join them. Today, their membership is in the tens of thousands. Gangs at USP have caused violent incidents to spike, nearly doubling in just five years. It falls to Sergeant Tracy Skinner to locate the gang members and keep them under control. It's Sergeant Skinner's job to pull out these gangsters from general population and put them in a special housing unit. Sergeant Skinner calls this fishing. It's like taking all the sharks out of the fish tank and putting all the sharks over here where the guppies can swim safely. We're gonna come and see if we can find, you know, any gang activity, uh, gather any intelligence that we can gather. This one uses a written code to keep the messages under wraps. Oh, hell yeah. See what I'm talking about? Where's our Swazi? Swazi. Oh, yeah. This right here is your runes. Who is it? So we got us one. We get the jackpot today. What we'll do is we'll actually, we'll continue going through stuff, get everything that we found. Just tell him, you know what, you roll up your stuff, you're coming with us right now. So he's going, it's already a done deal. This gang member's part of an Aryan group, one of many nationwide prison gangs here. The gangs in Utah, you know, they're very serious because what they're doing is they're they're watching what's going on in California, and they want to one-up California. 
But lately, it's a homegrown Utah gang that's been giving Skinner problems. Ogden. The Ogden Tresse come from Ogden City, Utah. Though few in number, they're fierce in battle. On the street, this local Latino gang sees the California-based Serenos as trespassers on their turf. Our main gang problem is right now is with Ogden Tresse and Serenos. Police have their hands full with gang violence. Every weekend, we'd, I'd say we'd have at least a shooting. And they start shooting, and I was just nothing like this. Boom, boom, boom. And when the Ogden Tracé get behind bars, their gang problems come with them. If they meet the Serenios, their arch enemy, their gangs demand, respond with violence. It's getting worse. The Ogden Tracé won't back down. It's 8 a.m. at Utah State Prison. Newly sentenced inmates arrive. Robert Terrasas and his friends founded Ogden Tresse when they were 12. He's been in and out of prison since the 80s. This trip is a 15-year sentence for getting caught with guns. I was there from day one when it started. A lot of people know that. I get the respect for that. When we was growing up, it was just straight, you know, fighting with our hands, you know, clubs, not whatever. The Ogden Tresse's hallmark Loyalty so extreme, membership passes from gangsters to their families. It's always fighting for territory. Before you know it, we just, it's just grudges, people killing each other. So it comes down from family to family. Robert's own niece is a member of the gang. Meet inmate Natalie Terrazas. This is her second trip to prison. The mother of five is now serving a two-year sentence for assaulting an officer. Relatives surround her in Ogden Tresse and in prison. So I have 10 family members here at the Utah State Prison. There's um, three generations of Ogden Tresse. It's uh, escalating. It's like getting bigger and bigger. The population is getting bigger and bigger. When you grow up in it or, or you have family members, you just automatically just go where your family is. That's kind of like religion. Natalie says her gang activity began with a violent initiation over a decade ago. It was when I was 11 and I got jumped in by five guys. Some of these men were involved. They just sit there and they just beat you. Uh, you just fight back. They do it for 13 seconds. They knock you down, but they didn't really knock me down. I just kept swinging. You just keep fighting and fighting and fighting until the 13 seconds is up. And then you party afterwards. The youngest gang members are called Pee Wees. Natalie says she carried out her first assignment, a drive-by with a gun, at age 12. That was the first time I shot at somebody. It knocked me back. <laughs> it, was, it was actually pretty scary. Because um, you don't really, I didn't really ever hear of gunfighting. I mean, you hear about it all the time on the news and stuff, but actually being the one that shoots the gun, uh, it gets your blood going. It, it gives you a rush. Natalie Terrasas admits she had a history of drug addiction on the street. Now, she's 27 years old and has a long criminal background. The inmate's just five feet tall and is guilty of theft and assault on an officer. I was on the run from Kiso and uh, they came and arrested me at my mom's house. Natalie wasn't compliant. She kicked an officer in the face splitting his lip. Like other Ogden Tresse members, Natalie says she puts the gang first, even if it costs the custody of her five kids. I have five kids, so I lost my parental rights. My other four kids got taken away when, in 1997, due to gang banging, due to me stabbing a female. So my kids were put in state's custody. I was still a kid, I didn't know how to love. I was too caught up in partying and stuff like that. Natalie's youngest child, a three-year-old girl, stays with relatives. But if Natalie gets into gang trouble on parole, she could lose her daughter. My youngest daughter is the one that I'm trying to get it right with. With her parole just weeks away, the committed gangbanger must choose between the gang 
and her baby. At Utah State Prison, officers face a different hurdle when criminals behind bars also happen to be mentally ill. 155 inmates live here. The Olympus Housing Unit, Utah State Prison's mental health facility. Even though up to half of the US inmate population has mental health problems, facilities like Olympus are rare. These inmates' crimes are as diverse as the rest of the USP's population. It's their behavior in prison that puts most of them here. It's pretty much the whole prison combined in this little building. All these cells in here, they have cameras, so we can watch them 24-7. Look in, make sure everything's OK. Officer Stewart takes precautions. After four years on the job, she knows some of these inmates are a danger to the prison and themselves. These inmates, um, they can switch on a dime. They're mentally ill. You don't know, you know, one day they're taking their meds, the next day they're not. They can come very violent. In extreme cases, unstable inmates spit on staff, tear up cells. But they'll bang on the door and come off their hands, and hopefully it won't. And mutilate their bodies. They'll use little teeny pieces of paper to saw it themselves for hours. Yet Officer Stewart chooses to work here. I actually love my job. I love coming to work, being able to talk to, you know, the different personalities, being able to help somebody if they need help. Um, I mean, you can't save the world or anything, but you can try, you know, with one person. <laughs> this guy right here, he uh, is on suicide watch. He plugs up everything, he wipes his feces all over the wall. The smell in here is very intense. Feces, um, they come out every other day, so I'm sure his feces that he has on his floor has been there, you know, a day, day and a half, just depending, but I can't even explain how bad the smell is. Going in there, it makes you want to dry heat. I mean, deaths don't smell as bad as some of these cells. It's just, it's just horrible. We have to deal with just things not an ordinary person would even think about dealing with every day. Staff reinforce boundaries on a daily basis. Well, they know who they can prey on. These guys are very manipulative. One year ago, Officer Stewart felt the risks of the job firsthand. She became a victim of assault. I had one of our schizophrenic um, inmates come up to me and get, he's about six foot five, so about a foot taller than me, come next to me really, really close and was hitting me on the shoulders, threatening to um, kill and then rape my dead body. He finally just walked away and went into his cell. That was probably the scariest thing that I've had in my career happen here. The next day, he didn't remember anything. Stewart refuses to be intimidated. I can't come in here every day being afraid um, because they'll thrive on that. I'm here to do my job, go home safely, hopefully. Go ahead and get up. Officer Stewart deals with dozens of aggressors on a daily basis. In the gang unit, Sergeant Skinner deals with hundreds. Last year alone, there were nearly 100 gang-related incidents at Utah State Prison. Three Serenios assaulted this inmate. They repeatedly sliced him with a knife. Only one weapon was found. But some of the worst attacks, when gangs punish their own for not obeying orders. When they have a violation, they'll cut up their own just as easy as they cut up their enemy. The prison's response to gang violence isolate the active gang members in special housing units. They're called security threat groups, or STG. Active gang members were everywhere. So now what we've done is we've tried to contain all the active gang members here in Ochre 4 to try and reduce the violence. 
They lock down inmates in their cells up to 23 hours a day. Automated doors and segregated cells separate rival gangsters. This is our control room. Uh, this is where basically where we control every cell uh, as far as each person that lives in each cell. We can control from here, opening the doors. We never open more than one door at a time. Mr. Hansen. The prison reserves STG for the most dangerous gangbangers. Today, Skinner meets a new arrival. Where are you from? Inmate Nate Hansen is a self-proclaimed Ogden Tresse. At 28 years old, he's already a career criminal. He's in prison for four years and has been an active gang member for over a decade. Have you got anything in there you shouldn't have? Anything gang related? Mm -hmm. We can't have gang stuff over here? I thought that's what this unit was for us, for gang members. Oh, well, this is the gang unit, but you can't have any gang related paraphernalia. You're not over here to gang bang. Well, that's, that was my. That's my intention. That's what I came here for. It's a gangbang? Oh, you guys facilitated us. No, facilitated we us. don't facilitate that. So here's your uh, rule book. Yeah. So you got to read everything in there, all right? Don't want to be able to sell. Don't be Don't be serenio killing. Or Central City local one, anyway. Skinner will segregate Hansen with other Ogden Tresse. But first, he searches for gang contraband. He's got a scrap killer. Scrap is a derogatory term for serenio. Their enemy is the Serenios. Gang communication can foreshadow activity, uh, even violence. Yeah, yeah, if we find any of that stuff, you get he'll get right up the stuff. All right, so, no more of that. Anyway, how long have you been from the Central City? Most inmates deny oh. gang ties, but Hansen okay, speaks proudly years. about the no, Ogden Tresse. Fifteen, sixteen, since I was about 13, 14 years old. How old are you now? Almost 30 now. Don't be beating anybody up. If you get in a fight, you're going to go straight to Max, no question. Hansen All disregards Skinner's face. advice. He, keeps he talks about fighting the Serenios at any opportunity. I'm going to go for it. We're going to go, we're gonna we're gonna go heads up, whether, whether they want to or not. Wow. It's on site. We're, on, we're, we're uh, definitely at war right now. All right, let's go ahead and roll up your stuff. Just wait for that day when when I get around somebody I can uh, deal with. Let's put you in your house. That's all there is to it. It's a waiting game. Always keep your eyes and ears open. Skinner keeps his eyes open too. He'll get more cell searches than other inmates will. We'll watch him closer when he's out on rec to see who he's associating with, you know, talking to. We'll listen to his phone calls more. He knows that with the Ogden Tresse, it's not a question of if violence will occur. But when? Out in general population, inmates have more liberties. Recreational yard time is a prison luxury. It's the one place where male and female prisoners interact. This is the matchmaking hour at Utah State Prison. What's that little short mama's name? Is that the, is that but they can't directly contact one another. A single chain link fence divides them. Right now, this is the walking program. I guess they get out there and get their exercise. But for us, it's the stalking program. Because that's all we do is stalk them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we we do, make yeah. some eye contact, you yeah. know what I mean? Just wag better. them down right quick when the cops ain't looking. Being out of physical reach from one another doesn't stop them from chatting. The most popular way to talk on yard is with sign language. Inmates call it flagging. Officers don't condone it, so inmates hide it from staff. Like this means from in the streets, there's, there's different things. This means I love you, you know what I'm saying? This means I, I want to hug you, you know what I mean? Uh, Hold, holding your hand, hug, yeah, just stuff like that. But if, it, if you want to get specifics on it, then you just spell it out, you know what I mean? These brides are good at it. Leslie Carno, the cousin of inmate Natalie Terrazas, can speak it. I mean, if you're going to do the alphabet, you always go back, uh, back, you know what I mean? Backwards. Everything's backwards. So if you're going to do the B, you do the B like that, the C, and then the D. And then, then you do the E, and then if you're going to pause, you're, you're, that's a pause. 
they keep moving. It's like the little entree at the restaurant where the pie keeps circling. That's what we do when we're looking at the pie circling. You get to pick which one you want. If you can't get that one, suck it up and find another one. You get, if you get a if you get a hit, she'll let she'll let you know. You be like, hey, mama, what's up? Can I write you? And then she'll, she'll give you, yeah, she'll exactly. she'll let you know. Yeah, if she gives you a name back, then you're good to go. And we got some ugly ones coming too. Damn. That's hey, that's the pie I was talking about. There's no good pie. That's no good. Leaving Yard with a pen pal is a success, but it doesn't happen every day. Parade is over. You wait till tomorrow. For some inmates, Yard is the place to conduct business, like making drug deals and solving inmate disagreements. And she's got to get dealt with, man, because that's... Natalie Tarasas is just weeks from being paroled, but she's still in a position of power. Her Ogden Tresse activity and lineage give her status within the gang. Inmates rely on her for advice. It's weird because you never lose that mother instinct, ever. And when there's a lot of young girls in prison or on the streets that come to me and need help, I automatically take them under my wing and take care of them. She also resolves routine inmate conflict. And we go, well, who's that one? Who's that one? And she wouldn't tell us a name. We go, that's what we Something talk. Natalie says she won't tolerate on your side disrespect with, with towards a gang. No. Like, and a recent okay. incident may force her to take action. There, there's been a lot of controversy over uh, white supremacy and Mexicans. A week ago, a female white supremacist saluted a male counterpart with a Heil Hitler. Paying tribute to the Nazis is a direct insult to minorities. The gesture disrespected the Latino gangs, and they retaliated. It started a big war. And these idiots spit in their food. The gang I'm conflict like, could turn that, violent. Well spit in their face. Today, a as a dedicated Ogden Trace, Natalie is doing? obligated to settle the dispute. I'll do anything when it comes to taking care of uh, one of my fellow people that belong to Ogden Tresa. There's no boundaries. Natalie can try to deal with the female inmate, but the male's out of her reach. To inform her fellow gangbangers over the fence, she'll smuggle them a note about the Aryan's action. To survive against bigger gangs, the Ogden Tresse has to be ready, but an upcoming attack is going to catch everyone off guard. At Utah State Prison, gang hostilities have simmered for months. Now, they boil over. 9.30 p.m. in the security threat group unit, home to top gangsters. A surveillance camera looks on. Two custodial crews clean the floor. One is the local Ogden Trace, the other, Sereños. A door normally separates rival gangs. Now, it's open. The enemies collide. They break into pairs for one-on-one -on -one combat, beating their opponent with mop sticks and a toilet brush. All four suffer injuries. Three mates' cuts are so deep, they spend time in the infirmary. A severe assault like this prompts an emergency clampdown. The prison raids the unit. Shakedowns like this normally happen twice a year. You're gonna wear it out, hand it out. Come on, They go. Make sure inmates aren't hiding weapons on them. Lift your arms. Lift your stand. Turn around, bob your feet first. Or inside their bodies. Okay, bend and spread. Okay. Next, Sergeant Norm and his officers comb through the cells. We check uh, everywhere in the cell. There's a lot of hiding places in a cell. I mean, they've got 24 hours of day to find these hiding places, and we just got to keep up on where they're hiding these weapons. So we find we do find a lot of a lot of shanks in these hidden places. Weapons and contraband could be anywhere, tucked in a magazine or a letter. We'll go ahead and open them up, and they'll have razor blades stuffed inside of them, which they use for, a, it's a very big weapon that they've got here, is razor blades. And even concealed in a vent. 
Uh, we go ahead and check them. If we can find anything, we have little pieces of metal that we can dig in here and, and try to retrieve the, the shanks or whatever they have hidden in these vents. With so much time on their hands, inmates turn everyday items into weapons, even paper. Moist and compress and mold it, and inmates have a rock-hard bludgeoning device. This is what's called a, a water stick. They can actually they hit pretty hard. It's just like getting hit with a baseball bat. So I've seen some pretty bad wounds with with uh, water sticks. So we go ahead and take them too. So this is the sort of damage water sticks can cause. But nothing compares to the wounds inflicted by a homemade knife called a shank. Inmates craft these out of anything, even toothbrushes. Today's raid yields few weapons. What it does do, inspire yelling. <laughs> They're not happy because we uh, clean them out pretty good. So they usually get like this after the shakedowns. We usually have a lot of problems afterwards, but it, it'll, it'll cool down. But inmates can easily create more weapons out of everyday items, like the meal packs. It is very easy for the inmates to make a weapon because we give them what they need to make the weapon. An officer stands guard as Ogden Tresse member Nate Hansen willingly shows how it's done. A rare glimpse into inmate weaponry. He uses a plastic knife from the condiment pack and shaving blades. Yeah, this is just one of the weapons. It's just, it's just, it's just one of the one of the many that are out there, just out of household items. Just something thrown together fast. This is something that you can throw together real fast. Loyal, valuable gang members cause damage when ordered. Hansen's got the skills, and the prison knows it. I'd rather get caught with a shank than without one. But getting caught without one might make you look like a mess out there on the tier. Might cost you life. Might make you look bad. You know, you don't know. What inmates do know is they must prepare for the unexpected. Women are no exception, and they can get violent too. Ogden Tresse member Natalie Tarasas shares her methods. Yeah, I don't like to fight with weapons. I'd rather fight with my fists. I like, I like beating people and watching blood squirt out. I'd rather just beat the shit out of them, know that it came from my fist, that I have that much power, than using a weapon and being a sissy. She knows just the place to settle scores, the freezer. This is one of the places that they turn around and uh, they get in altercations. Um, sometimes we'll have somebody outside of this door watching for the police, wherever they're out or whatever. And most of the time the fights happen in the morning because during morning shift and afternoon between the shift changes or whatever, it's easier because the cops are busy with all the inmates and trying to get set up for tray line. The freezers are both noisy and soundproof, making them ideal places for fights the best area to fight in because back there if the police were to come in or whatever they'd have to get through three doors in order to get back to this one and so it's actually easier to fight back here for women fighting in prison has rules don't bruise the face and don't raise the suspicion of officers get caught and get locked down when you are trying to fight it's mostly body shots that you want to get because you don't want to leave any marks on your hands or on your face or on your body above the head because then that signif signifies a fight. Despite the risks, Natalie's willing to fight. If anybody were to ever disrespect me or call me out my name or try to talk then of course I'm gonna, of course I'm gonna handle it. I'm not just gonna let them punk me. Today she shows how she informed her male counterparts about the white supremacist disrespectful act. Just last week, she says she wrote them a letter. Natalie shares how she did it. I'm writing one of my homeboys over here in Tim one, letting him know to handle this, this fool that turned around and uh, disrespected. He threw a Hitler sign. So I told him to handle it in here and uh, turned around and told him uh, and that he was talking and to handle that and then let me know what he needs done over here. Natalie sent a secret message called a kite through an underground inmate mail system. The only reason why we normally tape them around this way is so that when they get to the homeboys, they already know that they're, t that they're taped up. So that way, if anybody f***s with them or tries to take them apart, they'll, they'll know from the paper being ripped or whatever. 
And then you write their name on both sides, and then you put what hood you're from. See, just like that. Letters are critical to gang communication. The dots symbolize the Ogden gang's number, 13, or tres A in Spanish. Natalie has the kite transportation system down to a science. She works in the kitchen, which functions as the inmate post office. Natalie shows how she sent the kite. I need your name. It is really not that easy because most of the time the officers are up in front and they're like watching you or watching whatever happens or else they're running back and forth down the line and you always have to have like two or three people whether it means another inmate coming up and talking for you to the officers in order to distract them so that you can take care of it. The kite's placement isn't arbitrary. Picking a specific stack and a specific tray corner guarantees its destination within the prison. And when you're sending a stack, you make sure a stack is either in the right or the left-hand corner. When Natalie sent the kite, she knew she took a chance. Had officers caught her, they could have postponed her parole date. If she hadn't sent it, the gang would have had their own punishment. I would get the beat out of me. 15 minutes later, it arrived in the men's unit. Inmates here pass the mail, as well as barter and trade goods from cell to cell. The inmates' messaging system's efficient. That night, the mail Ogden Trasse took revenge against the white supremacist. Natalie received word the next day. And then a white dude that was actually in Star One just um, got beat up for the same situation. Uh, we sent word to the homies and he ended up getting beat up for saluting also. The Ogden Tresse letter reached its target, but next time they might not be as lucky. Inside Utah State Prison, it's up to Sergeant Skinner to prevent future gang wars. It's been a week since the Sorenio Ogden battle, and inmates in his gang unit have been quiet. Maybe too quiet. But sometimes, skin speaks louder than words. 101. Tattoos, gentlemen. Tattoos serve as gang trophies, and Sergeant Skinner knows how to read them. 18th Street. Tattooing's illegal here, but that doesn't stop inmates from marking themselves. They fashion homemade guns from everyday items, like pens and hairdryer motors. New tattoos alert the prison to gang activity and may even reward foot soldiers for completing assignments, such as beating down a rival. To keep gangsters in check, Skinner must be able to decipher the fresh ink. What do you got on your shoulder? What does it say on your shoulder? Let's see your arm. Put your arm back up. Let's see your feet. I know you're a tattoo addict. Hold on. We better take some pictures, too. Four control, two or five. Next, a visit to the Ogden Tresse weapons maker, inmate Nate Hansen. If the gang's planning revenge on the Sorenos, Hansen's probably involved. Hold on, we gotta strip out, so might as well get your clothes back off. See if you got any new tats. Hansen wears his gang's brand, Otresse tattoos, on his legs. They come here a lot, they know I'm active. I'm somebody that's in, got it, once you get a name with them, even if you ain't really doing nothing bad, they're gonna they're gonna keep coming here repetitively if they found in the past. But Hansen's stockpile of razors suggests he's planning something. What the hell is all? What do you got the razor blades in here for? Those are all intact. That's just my extra Why hygiene. The... Worshiper now. Well, I don't know if it's so much devil work. What's Strudel up to? Central up, loco. 
That's not how we want to start our letter. Yeah. All right, you got everything, our goodie bag? Once out of Hansen's sight, Skinner gives the letter a thorough read. The content alarms him. It tells Hansen he may have to attack an inmate who broke a gang rule, known as a violation. He's in constant communication with um, uh, known gang members out on the street, and they're, they're writing to him, telling him who has a violation coming so that he can deal with it. But the target is not the Sorenos. It's a fellow Ogden Tresse. Hansen seems to be plotting to take down a snitch. Gang members claim there's evidence, called paperwork, that someone from within betrayed the gang. This guy's here and he's got to do something to him, you know, because it tells him here that the, the uh, inmate is a rat and they've got paperwork to support it, so rat's not a good thing in prison. The targeted inmate lives within Hansen's reach, and until the Ogden Tresse notify him to attack, Hansen stays on standby. Skinner can't let gang members wage war in his unit. We take it seriously. You want to watch the ones that are, admit they're active because they're, they're the ones that are going to jump at the chance to get their enemy. Yes or no, do you have any safety concerns? No. The sergeant starts by informing the snitch that he's in jeopardy. So you're all right? Yeah, tell that, tell that comes through. Okay, well, if it comes through, you need to let us know. I can't protect you from the unknown. Yeah. But if something's gonna happen, you tell me. Skinner's next move, remind the gangbanger who's in charge. Nah, who's you? Gangs are a threat to anyone who crosses them, even one of their own. Ogden Tresse founder, Robert Tarasas, knows how ruthless his gang can be. They wouldn't hesitate to shoot you. They won't hesitate to whoop your they won't hit. They're not going to hesitate about it. They demanded the respect, especially for their hood. You know, and when they're banging, that's, that's the way it goes. He also understands the gang's allure. You know, it's, it's like a magnet. Like he's drawing you back to it. And every time I leave, I come back. For one reason or another, I come back and I end up in here. Look at me. 42 years old, already a grandpa, locked up still. I looked up to my Uncle Robert. I still do. I love my Uncle Robert with all my heart. I, lo I look up to him a lot. Um, he, he was my role model. Uh, I liked the way he handled stuff, the way he handled business, the way he put people in check. If anything, if I was messed with, he would handle it on site. With her parole just a day away, Natalie spends time with family and tries to prioritize her gang or her child. Just go out and be with your kids, man. How with everybody else? I'm stuck. To get her daughter back, she must stay out of gang trouble for a full year. I don't want my daughter to resent me. Me end up dying over a, a bullet wound or whatever and not thinking about her. I'm missing a lot in my daughter's life. She's only three years old, man, and she needs a mom because I don't want her to grow up in a gang. As a career gang member, Natalie's loyalty is divided and her choices limited. But she's considering an option that could change her life. It's recreation time in the security threat group unit. Sergeant Skinner keeps track of the gangsters. He hones in on one in particular. An Ogden Tresse letter put inmate Nate Hansen on the prison's radar. It warned him to punish one of his own. Now is Hansen's chance to attack the marked inmate. We're, we're in the control room right now and they can't see in here because we have the glasses got mirrors on. So they can't see in here, it's tinted. And they don't know who's looking at who or who's even up here. We're just looking to see who he's talking to, how he's interacting with, with other inmates. 
Let's see what type of body language he has. Then, Skinner spots Hansen with his target, the Ogden Tresse snitch. Hansen's telling him his options. The sergeant studies the two for clues of a looming fight. Facial expressions and even glares can be telling. Skinner takes no risks. At the slightest hint of aggressive body language, he confronts Nate Hansen in his office. Okay. So we read a letter. What's gonna happen with Mr. I'm not going to do nothing. I don't have any proof. The gangbanger waits for paperwork. Gang slang for proof. Are you going to wait till the paperwork gets here? Once the final orders arrive, either Hansen handles it, or someone else in the gang will. Let it catch up to him sooner or later, on the streets. Well, he's still got time here. He's going to. He's well, probably going to get dealt with here and there. So you get the paperwork, you'll tell me? Yeah. I'll let you know. Let's go. Okay. All right. Head back in. Don't do anything stupid. Yeah. Okay. Skinner knows better than to trust the gang member. The prison strips Hansen's privileges to the bare minimum and limits his opportunities to attack. But new opportunities can overwhelm die-hard gangbangers. Inmate Natalie Tarasas is about to find this out. Today, she'll be paroled. The most important thing right now is to make myself better, more than anything. And then I, my daughter will be better. With one choice, Natalie alters her life after parole. She decides to stay in a halfway house and stay away from Ogden. When I think of Ogden, I think of home, but at the same time, trouble. You know what I mean? With the capital T, because it's Ogden Thresse, just trouble. Natalie hopes to get a job and avoid gang trouble, but that might be yeah. impossible, even at a halfway uh, no, house. No, this is um, cream. I am really nervous about getting out and going to a halfway house because of enemies, because there's some girls that were just here a couple months ago that we had beef. That's what scares me. I'm nervous. We'll be fine. Natalie's arms from Talk Ogden so walk her out. Talk so you, don't want to. you really want to change your life? You need to get out of Utah. Breaking ties with Ogden Tresse means breaking away from her family. But who's down for you more than anybody? Family, of course. Okay, then. But family's Ogden Tresse, so what's so, the difference? Yeah. It's part of our family. That's how we grew up. So how do you really expect me to stop gangbanging and doing? when it's all I know is. But you're still in that. You need to break ties if you want to make something out of your life. And I don't want to see you back here no more, Natalie. I know. It's hard, man. I look in the mirror every day and I'm just like them because now my daughter is going through the same thing that I went through when I was younger. Uh, I love you too. Thank you so much, okay. How could I really resent and be a hypocrite towards my family for being in a gang and doing what they've done to me when I'm doing the same thing to my daughter? Um, three five nine three oh six seven eighty. Ready? I love you too. Natalie's been paroled before, and this time she's realistic. I can't say that I won't come back to prison though, because I don't know what the future holds. I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know what right now holds. And I know that I'll try my best to do whatever I can in order to succeed and be a good mom. One gangster leaves, but more spring up. The gang stuff is, it is going to spread, even with what we're doing, it spreads. You know, we've slowed it down, but we can't stop it. It's impossible to stop. But for now, gang battles continue, drawing in communities and tearing families apart, forcing more inmates in Utah State Prison to choose the family or the gang. They don't just risk body parts, they risk their lives. One of the most dangerous jobs in the world. Brand new to five, Axemen starts Wednesday at eight. Next on five, it's Boogie Nights.